Okay, and so over to you, Linda. Thank you very much, Afida and Wing, for that awesome introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm Linda. I'm super excited to be here. When IAL contacted me regarding this talk and what they're going to announce later, I thought it's appropriate to talk about spearheading and scaling eyes at work. I'm going to share with you whatever little I know in my journey on spearheading and scaling eyes. Let's go. So what is eyes? If we want to transform or if we want to innovate, we got to think out of the box. And most of the time we call that creativity. Now, if creative ideas are not put into action, it remains just ideas without legs. And so you have to put your ideas into action and we call that innovation. And of course, with innovation, it should create new value and bring you better revenue. So entrepreneurship is important. Now, let me just tip this around to make it easier for us to uh, remember. So in transformation, we need these three alphabets. Okay, so it's innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship. And that's what we call in Capital Land. I used to work in Capital Land as a senior vice president of innovation and learning and development. Okay, so, so we use eyes a lot. And I thought I'd share this with you to remind ourselves that at work, we need to create value. Competitors are really smart. They're looking at what you're doing. Customers' needs are changing. They're wanting more from product to experiences. So work is a wonderful place for us to learn and create value. And when that happens, it fuels enterprise growth. So I'm going to share with you spearheading and scaling innovation. So let's go with spearheading first. When we talk about spearheading, we're looking at a real need in the market, one that we can create value and that will deliver a greater impact. Now, to do that, we need to know who we are creating value for. So we profile the users, understand their needs, and we try to create a minimal viable product to prove the value uh, that this can scale. Okay, so the question then is, if you want to create values, whose problem are you solving? Of course, we need research. Okay, so we need to do research. And of course, you can observe, you can interview, you can put two photo journey, journaling, but if there's no empathy, it comes to naught. Empathy is a required ingredient in user research, the ability to understand and share the needs of the users. And the art of listening is so important. If you listen correctly, then it triggers the right use of the brain. Unfortunately, most of the time, even with all this research, there's no, there's no proof, real proof that will do well because our mind is full. And as a result, it affects our ability to listen well. And I'll suggest it under spearheading that you be mindful of the user that you're going to develop about. You have to be really mindful because resources are limited. And in this turbulent world, right, there's another set of skills, the ability to rethink and unthink. So what does that mean? When we say rethink and unthink, are we here to just solve problems? How about whose problem are you seeking? So what does that mean? Who are these problem solvers versus problem seekers? Problem seekers are people who identify things that user does not even know they need them. Problem seekers connect the dot, ask better questions, they learn, they adapt, and they create. So whatever they do is market-creating solutions. And John Mader says that good problem seekers are in higher demand than just problem solvers. And Henry Ford concurred. He said, if I had asked people what they had wanted, they would have said faster horse. And this is the man who brings automobile, automobile to the world. So there are many kinds of, of designers out there. There are people who will review and then they make things better. But it would be better if we can find out what's missing. Okay, it is, that's the blue ocean. And if you do that, you're actually operating in an unknown, unknown sector where the things you create are market, market making. For example, electric vehicle. So then in spearheading innovation, Design thinking is an excellent tool for you to use because you adopt a user approach. You form a multidisciplinary team so that you leverage on a broader band of capabilities. 
And then you get into critical thinking, connect the dots, go into creative thinking, prototyping, improving it, improvement uh, all the way and checking back with the user. So it's an excellent tool for you to use. And when we say create value, what does it mean? So I'm going to go through these three things, the good, the fast, the cheap. They are always in contradiction or intention. When something is good and fast, we say it's expensive. When something is fast and cheap, we say ah, it's poor quality. When something is good and cheap, we say slow. But if you can get these three areas to intersect, that white space, that blue ocean, is a place for you to create values that the world is waiting for. And so in spearheading, we're always very busy with creating value, who we are creating with, what are their work around. And when you have an idea, you need to deliver your idea and prove that it can create that new value. And in Singapore, we're so blessed that we have IAL and we have the InnoPlus fund that you can tap on. So this is a part where we are in the initial stage where the innovators and the early adopters will entertain or even join you in this journey. And so go to IALs, try InnoPlus, a $200,000 fund for you to spearhead, for you to create and prove your value. Uh, I, I, I benefited a lot from this. I learned a lot from every journey that I went on. And so I'll share with you the latest that we had, which is um, the one with uh, Sengkang Hospital and Kotek Quad. So when we were spearheading this innovation, let's look at the situation. So there are three, three kinds of uh, care, healthcare, primary care, like the polyclinics, uh, uh, the clinics that you go to, where you go and then you go home. Of course, we have the acute situation where you need to go to the hospital. And then, of course, older people like myself, we need longer care plans. So we may check in into nursing homes and home care. So we have this kind of three situations. So what's happening, connecting the dots. What's happening is, let me tell you a story of two uh, big neighbors. Mr. Go and Mr. Liu both had the same surgery, which is a stoma back operation. Four weeks later, Mr. Go, go home. Mr. Liu, Liu Xia Lai. In other words, he stayed, he has to come back. So what actually happened? Again, connecting the dots, right? What actually happened is that when patients after the operation, they stay in the hospital for a while and then they get discharged and they go home and they're supposed to take care of themselves at home. Challenges arise at home, okay, whether you're able to maintain that quality uh, health care that you receive in the hospital. Now, in the case of Mr. Go, his caregiver is able to do that. And so as a result, he stay at home. In the case of Mr. Liu, the caregiver is not able to do it. As a result, the first thing the family do, very anxious, they send him back to the hospital. So Mr. Liu, you see a line. Now, looking at medical journal, the 20% readmission rate will have cost about $30,000. And according to Professor Tan of Kutik Quad, he then says that patient education is so important that when you check out, you should be able to do that same care in the context of a home. So, so the tension here is, the idea here is, how do we create new value? We, we want to say that caring for patient at home is as important as in the hospital so that they don't check in again within one hotel, California, within one them, we want them to check out, right? So our problem statement is, how might hospital empowered caregivers to deliver quality care at home? for post-operative patient so that they don't come back? How do we do it in the form of a learning solution? So who are we innovating for? Home caregivers at home. It could be the patient himself. It could be a family member. It could be a domestic helper. It could be a professional caregiver. So what if we can give them something that they can take home, a take-home nurse, someone that, that you can turn to 24-7? So the idea is to create a simple to use mobile learning application for just in time based on the situation at hand, based on patient problems that you can retrieve. And that information is easy to understand, is competency based with a lot of visual so that it's easier to understand. When you need to buy um, supplies, uh, we even have a service matching directory. Uh, you can even call in with the hospital nurses through the teleconferencing call or chat with other caregivers. So this is it. So our solution is we wanted to create the value and prove I can. 
I can stands for Digital Carers Assistant Network. Caregiving is very stressful. So we wanted a network where all the health people are inside and they can support each other. So how do we empower caregivers at home to give quality care and to bridge that literacy gap at home? So our solution is able to do four things. First of all, just-in-time learning uh, is curated medical knowledge for caregivers depending on the patients that they have on hand. And then if you need to talk to somebody, you are able to Zoom or to call somebody. And if you need to buy uh, supplies, try and test it because you don't have time to try. You just need to go out there. So this is a try and test it. We are not a yellow pages yet. We're just helping the caregivers get their supplies. And finally, as these caregivers learn their competency one job at a time, they build up their capabilities. They can share with the other caregivers as well. They get recognized for every skill set that they pick up. So just a very quick one to show you. So this is what it looks like. If you need to learn something for the head, right? So it's patient problems. You'll be assigned those patient problems that you need to see. And it's in the home context. It's not the hospital context. And we promote micro learning, mobile learning. And then when you are done with it, you see all these badges, they will collect badges. And, and so progressively, they, they, there's a professionalization part for them. Now in the event that they need, we go and go out and buy some things, right? So there's this specialized medical equipment that they can uh, search, go, go under that tree, they can search what they need to buy and go out there and buy. So it's reliable, it's very fast, just to help them jumpstart. And finally, all the caregivers are in this community. So what then happened is they can chat with one another. They can set up that topic that they want to talk about. They can chat, they share best practices on the ground. And also we then promote ground up innovation because the hospitals are also looking at this and the hospitals are also learning how do we do caregiving in the context of a home. So with that solution, we had to prove the head, the hands and the heart where they can learn for the head, the patient, patient, uh, patient problems through the hands to do it, learning you can use. And also you're not alone as a caregiver. There's a network that you can tap on, whether is it nurses or is it fellow caregivers. So to summarize uh, for spearheading uh, innovation, looking at a real need to create value that deliver higher impact. And that a lot of it comes from looking at the users and created the MVP, and providing value. Okay, so the, once you are done with this, this proof of concept, it's about commercializing. So how do we scale it? Now we want to advance the adoption since it has created that value. So now we're talking about MNP, minimum marketable product. How can we accelerate this? How can we scale this so more people can use it? How do we attract other markets to join us? So a very good tool to use is because this is commercialization, is scalability, the first part, we talk a lot about desirability. Uh, under the spearheading, we talk about the value proposition, what the pain point it can solve. So it answers the desirability. Now, how do you scale this? This is the part you need to look at the feasibility. What are the activities you need to do? Who are the partners you can collaborate with? Can we form an ecosystem? You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to have everything uh, in terms of core competency. You can partner people with a wider range and together you can create better value. And of course, at the end of the day, does it make financial sense? Okay, so the viability. So this is an excellent one page where it covers the three important ingredients that we want to see when scaling innovation. Also, in terms of the diffusion, now we can push a little bit forward. We can go for the early majority to get more people on board. Um, you know, can I say something? Um, what I learned about innovation is people all respond to change differently. So I'm going to say something that you, you may find surprising. I learned to discriminate. As a senior vice president of Capital Land, right, when I do anything, I expect everybody to respond. And... To my surprise, not everybody responds. So I would say, look up for the champions who are ready to come on board. Work with them first, and then you multiply your success later on. So look up for the innovators, the early adopters in the first part, but the second part, push on to the early majority. So if I were to use the hospital example again, market penetration means getting more people to, to use the product. So for the existing surgical team, we can actually have more users sign up. 
Now, uh, because of the confidence that they have, then under new product development, the surgeon may actually have more courses. And so we train the nurses to develop their own courses so they can, they can put more patient problems out there. Uh, market development, how about other non-hospital, uh, other hospital departments like nutrition, uh, therapy, okay? And finally, uh, having worked with two hospitals, we realized that the community, the clustering, there are so many people involved. You have the IT, you have the legal system. It's really interesting if we can form an ecosystem to support it. Now, in terms of commercialization, another person that can make and break you is your stakeholders. You've got to manage them, got to identify them upfront who they are and manage them well. So let me just show you just for example, because of time, you know, I'll, I'll see you later on, we can talk more. The, the person that has high influence and high interest is a surgical team that we work with. Throughout the journey, there were so many barriers, obstacles. Is a surgical team that push on because of their influence and their interest. The caregiver are highly interested. They love what we are saying, but they have very low influence. And the one that we work with most of the time are the IT department and the legal department for the fact that it's PDPA, for the fact that it's patient's information, and they have many hierarchy and structure. So we have to make sure we meet all the protocol. Okay, so these people can make or break your journey. Now, let me give you another example. So today, I'm just going to tell you like frameworks to use and give you examples. But because some of them are like um, private, confidential, so I'll try and give as much as I can. Now, this is way back in 1981, is it? Or 1991? Singapore was about to launch another polytechnic. Okay, so then the late Dr. Tae In Soon put an announcement and he said that he believed that polytechnic education is the way to go. And there are two major reasons. And he said that the economy needs more polytechnic. And so Tomasic Polytechnic was born. Now, then what do you do when you're the new kid on the block? When you do not have history, where everybody will go for the established Singapore Polytechnic and Nian. So I happen to be teaching then I was a lecturer in Singapore Poly, and when I go over to Tomasi Poly, the kind of students that come by, the users are different. Now, if we use the same talk and chalk for a different users, then how can we create new value for them? Because these students have shown that they are not responding well to talk and chalk. So what do we do again? This time around, I, I won't talk about the jumpstart part. I won't talk about the spearheading. I'll go straight into the scaling part. So we did a little project. Then I was a course manager for diploma and marketing. So I took my, I took my um, department and I said, guys, I think we need to change. And change is like a religion. You can't force it. You can't force it. So I actually said, if you want to do what I'm doing, join. Stay on the bus. If you are not happy, it's okay. I'll, I'll put you into another department that's not doing this. So I was able to get those on board to be with me on board with the diploma in marketing. We do the spearheading part. But once we are confirmed, okay, to commercialize it, then uh, we scale this problem-based learning, a new way of learning into all the faculties in Tomasic Polytechnic. So you saw the four schools being mentioned. As we move those, we push on to early majority. Okay, so in terms of market development, I started out with year two and year three students in marketing. Once it confirmed that it worked, um, the entire business school adopted market penetration. I then uh, was wearing two hats. I was made to front Tomasic Center for Problem-Based Learning. And the whole idea is to get other faculty uh, to come in. So under market development, I had to go across discipline, train the other teachers. And interestingly, because our boys after graduation went to the army, the army noticed that the boys who were trained in problem-based learning behave very differently. And so the Singapore Armed Forces came and they wanted to learn. Within uh, business school, we look for more courses in terms of product development. We also look, look, we look to IT people to see how can we use problem-based learning and IT together. Uh, what are the stakeholders that I have to manage? It was a very interesting time because I have an outgoing principal who is for this. I do not know if the incoming principal is for this. And sometimes innovation can just stop there if the new leadership is not for it. So I have to manage principals and school leaders. Faculty, some are for this, some are not. Again, you have to manage. You have to tell them more. 
the hesitation came because they didn't understand. And students are easier to manage because they welcome anything that's non talk and chalk. I also need to convince employers that our students in this way of learning are as good as the conventional. And most foreign students do aspire to get, to get a degree and most of them headed to Australia. So with the limited funding that I had, I had to find out like, I had to go to Australia and talk to the university to make sure that the accreditation uh, is approved. So the burning question then is, how might we design, deliver, assess learning for our students, our users who are different and prepare them well for the next step? Whether is it a career or whether is it for the study, how do we do it? So then there's uh, the enterprise challenge and it's at the Prime Minister office. So I went there to secure the fund and also beside funding to secure that it is okay to value, to innovate and to do something different in education. And with that, I um, gotten the award and, and so that started the journey. It's, it was, this is uh, way back in what, 2001, it's also $200,000. And we appointed our mentor, Professor Howard Barrows, medical schools to be our mentor. And do not underestimate the amount uh, of buy-in that you have to do from talking to my own faculty staff, to other faculty, to employers, to students, there's a lot of conversation. I shared with you, I was at the crossroad of the founding principal, Dr. Baraprasa, is for this because our tagline is young, bold, caring. Then we had a new coming in principal, Mr. Bu. I had to manage both to make sure that the support is there. Um, senior management hesitated, but like I say, it's because they need more information and I, can't, I couldn't do the job. So we do a lot of video conferencing with Professor Howard Barrows hear it from the horse's mouth. And of course, more and more training um, and sharing with other faculty, more support. And in terms of processes, uh, first you've got the people, then you do the processes, make it simple. So we set up the Tomasic Center for Problem-Based Learning. In the photo, you saw all these other, it shows you that by then it has scaled to the other discipline, the other for all four schools at Tomasic Poly uh, are embracing PBL. Um, Dr. Vara Prasad also set up the Tomasic Center for Problem-Based Learning as the process. We also took on to, to uh, host the Asia Pacific Conference for PBL and do all the materials because otherwise it cannot scale. Okay, I'm going to show you a snippet of the videos. Ooh, the sound, is it okay? Okay. okay. Okay, sorry about that. So we're going to show you three small videos that show you the, the milestones of the journey. The Diploma in Marketing at Tomasic Business School, Tomasic Polytechnic, decided to embrace this challenge by reinventing higher education. Armed with funding from the Enterprise Challenge from the Prime Minister's Office, we embarked on a journey we strongly believed would prepare our students for the world of tomorrow. Okay, so this is the Prime Minister Award, getting that for the funding and the validation to innovate. Problem-based learning is a um, learner-directed, active involvement way of learning, where the student become involved in the learning process, they clarify, identify the issues, they clarify, and they went out to self-discover. According to leading PBL authority, Howard Barrows, Problem-based learning is the learning that results from the process of working toward the understanding or resolution of a problem. Traditional and PBL methods of learning differ in the following way. traditional way we deliver the program over a three-year curriculum is by subjects. And the, the limitation of such an approach would be that students often learn in very much a silo approach. Um, very often they don't see connections between subjects. Whereas in the real world of marketing, problems are multidimensional and they're required to think laterally across. 
So in PBL, we, we teach them to, to solve problems which require them to draw from many different subjects and solve them in a practical way. The advantage of problem-based learning is that students are active learners, they are not passive. So when they are engaged, that's where the passion comes on and they do much more. Uh, for once, you see in PBL classes, students don't fall asleep and they actually remember the content better because of their hands-on approach. For PBL, students learn by doing. They hone their problem-solving skills during their learning journey. Through PBL, students develop reasoning skills by determining what they need to learn, seeking relevant data, synthesizing the data, and providing solutions. They draw conclusions and develop solutions by drawing information from a wide spectrum of resources. Okay, and finally, I'll show you the validation from the universities. Today, we are pleased that our PBR program has been validated by various relevant bodies, including our students, potential employers, and foreign universities. I must say I was very impressed with the uh, way they conducted themselves during the whole course of uh, working together with us and I feel that their problem-based learning skills which has been taught to them and being applied during the course of work with us is definitely one of the uh, biggest feature that I uh, find to be very advantageous to them and I think with this problem-based learning skill they will be able to proceed uh, very progressively in terms of moving into the working world. Uh, I realise that uh, this group of students, uh, they have a sense of uh, maturity and they are very eager uh, to work with the project uh, with us and uh, really desire and believe that they can do a job well done for us. Our international panel of advisors include leading PBL experts like Professor Donald Woods from Canada Professor Charles Fraser, Professor Carol Anderson, and Dr. Christy Ahn from the USA, and Professor Charles Petty from Australia. To ensure that up-to-the-minute PBL practices are used, world-renowned PBL consultants like Professor Howard Barrows and marketing consultants like Professor Craig Kelly visit us regularly to validate the rigor of our program. Okay, so, so when coming to scalability, people are so important, managing uh, the stakeholders, and then of course the processes, keep it simple so that more people uh, find easier to, to come on board. Um, these are again, you know, in Australia, we identify Australia because majority of the students will go down under having to go out there and talk to the various people, okay? Of course, when you deal with the people, you deal with the processes, at the end of the day, you also have to show performance. So I, I told you about the, the Singapore Armed Forces because they received boys of different academic abilities and, and they came on to want to learn uh, how to do problem-based learning. Again, not uh, the School of Logistics is the first one to come on board. And then, of course, you, you get awards for your work for public service. Uh, other performance uh, results we get, apart from our poly students doing better because it's no more talk and chalk, we also receive interest like this uh, Indian science, maths and science teacher coming all the way to Tomasek to want to learn how to do this. Okay. And then, of course, we roll out to Asia. We got a lot of inquiries and a lot of chance to share. I think what's wonderful is the opportunity to share, to learn, uh, because when you go across culture, there's so much learning. Okay, now let me do a non-learning related organization. Let's talk about Jumbo. Jumbo um, always have this long queue and people love to eat their chili crab. And so that's a pain point. So we went through, with, um, and then was called Spring Singapore. We went through the spearheading part. So at the spearheading part, we were thinking how to bring chili crab to the world. How do we cut that queue so that people don't queue, but they can enjoy chili crab anytime. But later when the, the project was successful, we were able to scale to other signature dishes for Jumbo. Jumbo is a restaurant, f &B, but in this project, we actually grew the retail arm. So what we are talking about is that what if we give you a Jumbo chili crab retail sauce pack that you can go back and buy your own crab and cook it. So market penetration, we sell immediately to the diners who are queuing up by eating and who love the chili crab. Uh, once it's successful, under new product development, we then scale it to the other brands under Jumbo, like the Asio Bakute, 
and other recipes. As long as it's signature dishes, we will give you the retail pack. We even sell chili sauce. Market development, apart from the restaurant that's so busy, we set up an e-shop. They also went into department stores like Isetan Retail and also sell to overseas market. Um, so to do this, who are the people that are doing over? Um, we have Central Kitchen, okay, so the, the, the chef, okay, management must agree to do this. Is there a dilution of the core business going from FMB to retail? Is there a conflict of interest and focus? Then the R&D chef, the restaurant had to talk about, is that cannibalizing their sale? We also have to, to work with authorities. For example, if we want it to be HALA certified, can we do that? Because the spices doesn't have, you know, who have met the requirement or not. So we have to go through the authorities as well. When you want to get into the supermarket shelf, the expiry date, the preservatives, all these, all these stakeholders. Um, the outlet crew, they can influence because they are with the customers. However, they have very low interest because they sell, they see themselves as a restaurant crew. They didn't see themselves as a retail crew. So they were not willing unless we, we rethink how they should uh, benefit from selling the retail packs. Okay, so you can see the various stakeholders, how do you move towards them? So the question then was, uh, how might we bring signature dishes to the world so that diners can enjoy anytime, anywhere? And we started with, for the, for the spearheading part, we only start with chili crab and we only start in, and, and in Singapore, the, the two crab dishes. So we wrote this map, then we went to Spring Singapore and got the funding, okay? And so under the spearheading part, this is the spearheading part. Okay, so under the spearheading part, we come up with the retail pack. We come up, you can see this is the retail pack. You can see there's no brand promise. You, there's ingredients is there. This is the uh, pepper crab, chili crab. Then the commercial, uh, the, the, skill, the spearheading ended with this. So customer give us feedback. They say, you need to include your packaging. I can't see you in the supermarket shelf when there's just so many things. Yours did not stand out. And we don't understand why we're paying so much money. They didn't understand, but we are a restaurant brand. So we have chef, we didn't understand that. And some say, I didn't even know you have an e-shop. And they felt that generally there's no publicity. They are not aware that, that Jumbo actually has retail packs. And even if, I, even if I want to buy, right, there's limited channels available for me to assess. And so in the commercialization phase, we have to address all these things. So make it bold, make it bigger, easier to see. What's the brand promise? You say it's not worth the money. Well, at the, at the, at the spine of the box, impress like a chef. Because we have chef and this is a restaurant brand. Regardless of your proficiency level in cooking, you will be able to turn out the chili crab the way we have in the outlet. Uh, except we cannot guarantee you the size of the crab depending on what you can get. Um, the so we have just learned our share. Hello, 大家好,我是珍宝海鮮集團的自行總廚 黃仲元 今天想為大家示範的一道珍寶海鮮的名菜辣醬 so I'm going to go on, but you get it. So you want people to come on board. The process part is very, is very important. Make it available. The e-shop, okay, the e-shop, improving on the e-shop. And then even make sure that there is a retail corner in the restaurant so that we increase accessibility to buy. Create awareness as you turn the menu, you actually see a, a, a flyer that actually said the inserts that says that we sell this uh, retail pack. Then more brochures, more flyers. Okay. We even took part in a Food Asia, Food Hotel Asia exhibition to create awareness. Okay. This is my last case study. Then I'll conclude with what I've learned about spearheading and um, scaling innovation. Um, so I'm going to share with you the, my, my, my years in Capital Land. If you, if you look at Capital Land, when you say Capital Land, people think buildings. But you know, behind every building, is the people who make the building, is people who create the building, is people who make the building enjoyable. And we are always looking at how to make it better. Okay, so it's the people. So 
if it's the people, then, then at one stage, I was called back to do as l and D, even though I, I want to look at retail. My PhD is in retail because we figure out that learning and development is so important to put all the business vertical together. So when we move this l and D culture, I noticed that not everybody is warming up to it at the same level. So we identify who are the innovators. And interestingly, it's our finance department. They were very interested in learning design thinking. Whatever you have, they're very keen. And so we, we kind of work with them. And because of the success they have, then it kind of multiply. They become our champion. And very soon, we have all the business vertical from the residential, retail, commercial, you name it even to other regions, meaning that I have colleagues from China flying in, Japan flying in. So every time we run a class, we make sure 20% are regional participants. In that way, we think like an integrated company rather than a Singapore-based company. And finally, we don't do alone. We have the architects, we have the subcontractors, we have the contractors, and we are also part of Tomasic Link. So we bring all these partner in. So what started out for, for ourselves to use, we look at a bigger ecosystem. If our partners are not doing well, we can't scale too, okay? So the idea was to set up a school. The idea was to focus on capability development, okay? So we tried to penetrate, but I, I couldn't gain traction, but finance came out strong. So I took finance out. I spent all my budget on them. I worked with them. And when I had success story, the other functions become interested. So then that's how I, I managed to penetrate. Now, um, in terms of market development, as we grew, we have 22,000 employees. We not only have a physical uh, climb, I'll tell you about climb later, it's our, the name of our school. We actually have an e-climb, the digital version. We also take our program, we're no longer space, uh, Fix. We take the look. We take our program and we'll go to different countries. So we do overseas runs and we go regional and we start to include our partners. Now, in terms of product development, we're always looking at um, it's really, really way back in 2006. Our learning was not uh, for qualification, but it's because of the business challenges that we had. When you are capital land and you want to train, Mm, I went to real estate, uh, I went to NUS, I went to talk to real estate professors, they're really good in the principal part, but the practice part of real estate, uh, our CEO has to come down and do the training. So you see things like ice camp, ice camp is our design thinking camp, capital land leadership program is done by Mr. Liu Man Yong, and real estate 100s is a real estate course where all our partners, our lawyers, our bankers, they all come in to help us groom our, our leaders to be. Okay, so uh, it's very hands-on and we involve our partners. Okay, so these are the various stakeholders I have to work with. The first of all is management, right? So the, the CEO council must approve this initiative and then CLIMB was set up. CLIMB is that group of people that look after um, we, we are not really learning and development. We are capability, we are about community, we are about collaboration, co-learn and co-create. So we are not interested in the front part. We are always very interested in the ending part is what can we co-create? And in fact, when we run programs, all the CEOs will fly by. We were at Sentosa. CEO will come by because they want, they want to know what are you co-creating? So that's how innovation is a way of life in capital land. Now, to make things very authentic, very real, very workplace learning, our partners are also our trainers. For example, uh, when we place instruments, we work with, let's say, Standard Chartered Bank. They also come in and train our people. When we deal with lawyer, one partnership also come in and teach real estate law. Okay, so we are an ecosystem. We help each other so we become better. And now, of course, you have the employees and you have and later part, because of the, the success, the performance, um, then we got requests from our partners to say, can we come in? So the Tomasic Link company, uh, Mr. Liu was also looking after Changi Airport Group. So we also opened to them. Okay, so because we believe in our ecosystem. So we started with this for Capital Land to be the leading real estate giant uh, in Asia, my time, okay? I, I don't know what's the latest vision now. Uh, so the question is, if we have all these verticals, we are across all the region, right? How might we collaborate? How might we co-learn? 
And how might we co-create across our business division and, and regions to achieve that performance vision that was set up for us? So we use learning and development as a platform to make this happen. So it's a place where, where we are going to co-create business ideas. We have regional people coming down. So that explain the investment on this building. It's been taken down by St. Joseph already. We call it Klein because it's an institute of real estate management and business. And in this place, we also do leadership. Um, and then of course, I told you leadership is very important management. Mr. Liu believe, believe in people development. He believe in workplace learning. He believe in innovation. So there he is with Richard Hu, Dr. Richard Hu and our late president. And we have to build the facilities uh, to support our activities and learning. So you see like lecture style, you see flexible cluster style, style, you see simulation because design thinking sometimes needs us to throw cushions on the floor and let them have fun. So our facilities have to be very flexible. And, and to jumpstart this journey, Mr. Lee himself wrote a book, okay? And, and that is the Capital and Culture book. There you go, processes, make it available. And then of course, these are the group of people that work with me to, to roll up to commercialize learning and development. Okay, and then this is just one of the many programs we have. They are all workplace related based on workplace needs. Okay, so to recap, right? Scaling innovation is about you want to advance adoption. So if you want to advance adoption into the MNP, you need to do that one page. Test your desirability, feasibility, viability. Okay, identify your stakeholders because they can make or break you. And sometimes halfway through the project, the stakeholder changes. Okay, so, so manage the outgoing and the incoming one. Uh, make the, make the, after managing the people, make the process easy for them to come on. And then of course, it has to result in performance and scale the new value creation fast, scale the resources, scale the capability. So in a nutshell, what I have learned in spearheading innovation is care, the care model is about connecting the dots. As a result, after you connect the dots, you ask better questions. Don't just ask questions, ask better questions and research on the users and explore what's missing besides incremental, but what else is missing? So that gives you that blue ocean, blue sky thinking. So what you should be focusing on is you're here to create value. Then you deliver the value, you prove that the value is there. And tools that I suggest will be design thinking and goal setting. Goal setting is a very tricky part, right? When I was at the prime minister office pitching, one of the uh, jury asked me this question. He said, Linda, what if you fail? I was then like 36 years old. I didn't know how to answer. So I stood there for a while and I said, sir, if there's no element of failure, can we call it innovation? Sir, so can I turn the question the other way around? What if I make it? So what I learned is that, yes, to be accountable, you need to do your goal setting, but please always think there's, there's the need for plan B because there are so many factors not within your control. You can't see it. So that flexibility is needed. Okay, so have a, have a most likely, least likely uh, scenario, okay? And come back with why it didn't work or why it worked very well. Okay, says for spearheading. Now for scaling innovation, when you want to scale it, it's about three Ps. It's about your people, stakeholder management, it's about keeping the process simple so that you get that buying as well. And it's about delivering the performance. Once you start to deliver performance, it will motivate, it multiply and get other people to come on board. Okay, so the focus is how do you scale this value fast? If you have, you have to have the people and the processes. How do you develop minimal marketable product? How do you form ecosystem? Don't try and do this alone. If you have people that you can collaborate with, you co-learn, you co-iterate, you co-create together. So these are some of the tools, business modeling, uh, because you are collaborating with different people, they are all experts in their own way. But if you have the same shared business model, we are all on the same page. Then they are empowered to use their expertise to make it happen. Of course, you talk about positioning and targeting. So in the case of Jumbo, it's impressed like a chef. It's about bringing chili crab to the world without having you come to our restaurant. 
NSOF matrix is always about business development. I use NSOF matrix for growth. Where's the money coming in? Who, which segment can I, can I go? Can I cultivate? And finally, ecosystem, always be on the lookout for partners who are like-minded, who has uh, expertise that you don't have, uh, and they're really good in that. So collaborate with them. Do not manage them. Do not micromanage them. Trust that they'll do a good job. So the whole idea is when you get together, you build a bigger pie and we all have more to eat. Okay, with that, thank you so much. And I'll hand you back to William or Win. Yep. All right. Thank you very much, Linda, for the sharing. Before we move to uh, William, let's first address some of the comments and uh, questions. So if you have any questions for Linda, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Otherwise, we will uh, look through some of the questions that are already in the chat. And I know a lot of the comments have to do with like, uh, what's the point of sharing about experiences or, uh, you know, what about funding? So this is where actually William will be coming in to share about the various kind of uh, in, uh, support and funding that InLab actually has. So uh, please be patient with us. We'll move on to that bit. Uh, at the later part where William is doing the sharing. So for now, um, Eddie actually asked two, three questions initially about uh, Linda's project. So Linda's project was actually part of uh, the Inno Plus grant. And Linda, would you like to help us to address the question first? So for Eddie, he asked how much does it cost to do the app? And can a person without tech knowledge actually do it? Yeah. Please uh, go back to the computer. Yes. This is so fun, isn't it? <laughs> fun. Yeah, yeah. Just wanted to say that uh, IL is like, it's like family, you know, coming back here. Okay, so question is, uh, how much is the app? Well, it really depends on the feature that, that you want to create. So if you have in-house capability, then that's easy. If you don't have in-house capability, you need to be very clear what's your specs. And there are many out there regionally. You can go to India, you can go to Vietnam. Um, so it's really up to you. But I would just say that when you apply for Inno Plus, please know that it's a learn tech. Is a learning tech application. So to be very clear, like what is the learning you're trying to innovate and how do you use technology to drive it? So even if you don't have technology background, but you understand the tension in the learning or how learning can be better, I think you've got a good, uh, good place to start. And then ecosystem um, network, right? Go look for a, a person that can do the tech part for you. I hope that answer. Okay. And uh, we'll just take one more question before okay. we move to William's part. Okay. Uh, we can do the follow-up, which is, must the MVP be tried on real cases? Like just like you mentioned uh, on Mr. Go and Mr. Hughes, and what is the sample size exactly? Hmm. Yeah. What, what is the question again, sorry? <laughs> okay, give me a moment while I scroll through the, com uh, the comments. So the question is, um, must the MVP be tried on real cases? And also, what is the sample size mm. for the project? Okay, good question. So usually when you do something like that, you need prototyping institutions to house with, right? So then we need to talk. So with the surgical team, uh, surgery team, we sat down and we it is a problem on their side. So then they will, they will specify the numbers they're looking at, yeah? We will take the numbers and then we will talk to IAL. Is that the numbers they are comfortable with? So once that's agreed as a key performance target, we will use that uh, to measure. Okay. Now, challenges, challenges. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, that's what we think. But when we hit the ground, right? Oh, you have to hands off because PDPA, you're not allowed. So they, certain part, they will take it but we don't get to see it because of PDPA and some other sensitive information because as the project roll on, more departments are, are being called in and they all have their concerns and we have to respect. So I'll go back by saying that start, it has to be a key performance target that both sides agree. In our side, we are answerable to IAL. So it has to be a number that IAL is, think is fair and then the prototyping hospital thing is fair. We lock in that number. Okay, then when we hit barriers like because of PDPA, they will declare the numbers, but they cannot declare who are the people or the details of the people will come back at all times, keep IAL in the loop. Such is the nature of innovation because 
that's why it's called innovation, right? You think, uh, but when you hit the ground, a lot of things comes out. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Linda. <laughs> because there are two very really good questions. Can okay. I just call you okay. one for okay. a while? Yes, right, friends. So, sure. <laughs> just quick responses with you, all right? So the first one is by Mary. How do you, how did you maintain confidence even among like uh, failures? Yeah. I think it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this is such a good question, right? Um, I say this yesterday in an interview. I say this to all of you. Uh, I think you must, in your heart, really want. I think in your heart, you must believe in betterment, that things can be better. So, in the face of failure, of course it hurts. But if you believe in betterment, you'll be able to come out. I once read this book by Palm. Uh, Palmer Parker, he said, there are good days and there are bad days and both come because you love what you do. So for me, I feel, I feel that I want to improve the situation. If I fail, my idea is, what am I missing here? I never see failure as fixed. I see failure as temporary. I see failure as a chance to discover what did not work. Yeah, so I think that's how uh, I come out again. And then the other thing is never assume um, when I wanted to do problem-based learning, it's so easy to just read about it. But I had to. Uh, my boss said, uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't need this. And I, I, if you want, you go ahead. And I just took leave, pay my own air ticket, fly to Canada and sit with the student and learn. So I think to be really curious, to investigate everything, to do that due diligence. Um, yeah, and I think that's progress. So I would say, is it Mary for taking that first step? You're not a failure. Don't let what they say. Yeah. And that's a very good response. <laughs> and just one last question, all right, by Patrick. So if the product has a few different features, what is the strategy to do market research to see if there's a demand for that feature and the winning SKU of the product? Mm. Mm. Patrick, right? Patrick, I would say you need to focus because uh, it's true when I create something, there's a lot of features, but you know, the budget is so little to, to sing so many, say, to say so many things. So I, I find that what I do is I look at all the features. I look at the target customer, which one like more feature. And like I says, I look at the product champion because you know, I was so naive last time when I was an innovation person, right? If boss give me a million dollar, if I have five departments, I thought, okay, each one take 200,000. But I realized that no, some people got bigger appetite for innovation. So I would say, look at your features, then look at your target customers, which is the one you can gain traction faster. Go for that one. Have one quick win first. Because when you spread your resources over too many things, they can't see it. So you must have a flagship feature, then you add on the rest. In the case of ICANN, our flagship feature is on the job, um, just in time, just for me, caregiver information. Because, you know, at the checkout, they give you brochure, they tell you so many things, and then you need to collect the medication, so information overload. So if we just give them, if, if your patient is stoma back, you have the stoma back, how to take care with a lot of videos, that's a good start. So we didn't try to do too many things. We sell them big on, you go back, your number one problem is how to take care of the patient. We sell them on that. Then our second and not so important feature is a service matching. Just in case you need to buy stoma bag supplies. We don't really focus on that. We focus very big on the patient education. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Linda. Anyway, I'll be coming out. So I'll chat with you more, okay? Okay. Thank you very much, Linda. And so now it's time for the juicy stuff. We have William who will be sharing us with us a suite of initiatives that can support uh, funding and how you can move from MVP to MMP. So very excitingly, this is actually the launch of our new initiative called InnoSpur, which William will share more about. And we're also very lucky to have SSG here today with us supporting this event. So without further ado, over to you, William. Let me just share the slide. Okay. Uh, okay. I think yes to done now, it's still morning. Good morning to all. Yeah. Uh, I would like to start this, uh, this uh, event. First of all, I would like to thank SSG uh, for the initiative and then uh, for, for making IAL the uh, program manager to be in charge of this, uh, uh, this program. Also, and also, I would like to thank SUSS 
uh, and IEL for taking up the initiative. And definitely, I would like to thank you yourself for making the time over here. Uh, thanks for the, uh, for the morning effort, especially for those who come over here. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, of course, I would just certainly want to thank the IEL uh, team, the organizing team for making this, uh, this come true. Uh, okay, so these are the four agenda. So um, the uh, this will be about 15, 20 minutes. And at the end of this, uh, I think you know that uh, for those who sign up for the special clinic, uh, we will continue with the special clinic. Uh, yeah, uh, subsequent after this, uh, this this whole stuff. I will start with uh, uh, this. I will start with uh, uh, what is learning innovation. I think it's important to get the concept right because. Uh, here, we are not talking just about innovation. We know about the innovation. Uh, more than just a tech innovation, there must be element of learning innovation. So learning innovation, learning is a way. Huh? It's a way of learning. So we are referring to the way of learning, whereby how you design, how you develop, and more importantly, also how you deliver. So those are the definition of learning innovation. Let me just click to the next slide. Uh, wing the next slide. I think the oh okay. So this next slide, the next three three slides are a bit on IAL. So in IAL, we our key focus will be on capability development. Many of you are very familiar with IAL. We also do um, uh, uh, do workplace learning, and a very core function that we do over IAL will be the uh, research. And uh, lastly, uh, whereby we are from, we are from the learning innovation side, whereby we lead innovation and experimentation in pedagogical learning, design and practice. So uh, the innovation center for the CET, so InLearn is the innovation center for CET, whereby we actually do uh, matchmake expertise, uh, facilitate collaboration, and we provide a space for innovation. The place you are sitting down is the uh, open space uh, that, thereby we also allocated for innovative collaboration discussion. And we want to strengthen capability, which is also the, uh, the objective of all our programs. And lastly, uh, the word spur, we want to spur knowledge exchange, uh, uh, whereby this is also the last and the key focus of the uh, innovation center. So by doing so, we want to build a vibrant learning innovation ecosystem. The key word is ecosystem. We want to engage interested stakeholders like yourself. Thanks a lot for coming in again. Who wants to value add uh, to drive innovation in the CET learning? So again, here is uh, what we also do is we partner with a purpose. So we get involved to contribute to our programs and initiative, you can please join us. And jointly, we will create value for the CET learning. And together, we will stay on the cutting edge by participating in or adopting the learning solution, trial and prototype and sandbox. Uh, and lastly, uh, together with you, we will develop proprietary next generation innovation, incorporating the latest know-how, ag tech and practices. So this is certainly suitable for uh, TA, uh, training providers and practitioners, enterprises and industry associates, and solutionists. Oh, I think they click. Ah, now it's okay. Okay, so our... So, okay, so the TAE learning journey actually starts uh, with, uh, uh, for our case here, we have the Indolog, in no bite, whereby we raise awareness and we provide bite-sized learning, and then we move on to the move on to the uh, to the uh, proprietary innovation design program to so build capability to build development, and then we move on to the uh, to connect it, uh, organization, and of course, lastly, uh, we we have the uh, the the Indo -Duff. Uh, over here, actually give a snapshot of some of the programs we, uh, whereby you should be al already very familiar. We have the InnoGem, whereby it offers the $5,000 grant 
to do ideation work. And then we are uh, following up through, we have the Inno Plus, whereby we offer uh, up to 200,000 competitive grant to do prototyping. Uh, I got to use some jargon here. So this prototyping, uh, usually the prototyping would result in the word we call technology readiness level of around three to four. Uh, so it starts with ideation, zero. And then after ideation, it may result in one or two. And then from, from InnoGem to InnoPlus, the, uh, the product is being concretized. We are looking at a technology readiness level of three to four. And to do so, uh, we, uh, we, we provide, uh, InnoPlus provide up to 200,000. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, other than that, we also do brokering, adoption brokering. And uh, we, we have another, an, another internal in-house of uh, garage work whereby we do translation of research into a tool to improve design and delivery. So some of the uh, accolades uh, from the InnoPlus. Uh, so here you are able to see Logistic Institute, uh, Asia Pacific, Changi, General Hospital, Leeton Academy, etc. So these are the fantastic uh, spin-off of the completed projects uh, from the InnoPlus program. And uh, we certainly because uh, receive uh, acknowledgement of our effort, some of this uh, acknowledgement comes to, through the straight time, the nurses who are also uh, innovators, or et cetera. And then these are the another, um, uh, some other international recognition of IAL expertise in online learning. Okay, now, yeah, exciting thing starts now. Uh, first, uh, start on the key words that we need to know is Inland 2.0. So building on the past achievement, we are now into Inland 2.0. We are taking Inland 2.0 to take us on a very targeted approach. Uh, so with a purpose to co-fund, co-share the risk of promising innovation and to grant regulatory waivers to you to remove barriers that may hinder your testing of uh, learn tech, learning innovation and to create a conducive environment for prototyping, testing, scaling up of learning innovation. So on the right side, the blue side, we focus on the Inland 2.0. We would incubate further. And more importantly, the new word is accelerate promising solution. Uh, this is done by identifying medium-term problem statement. We are very focused on problem statement in uh, for the accelerator. So we you you need for applicants who are interested to apply for the uh, InnoSpur, uh, the problem statement has to be very clearly defined. And, uh, and uh, we also look into priority concern that whether you have addressed the priority concern in the TAE sector. And, uh, and uh, another key attributes of the uh, Inland 2.0, we want to create a conducive environment for prototyping, testing, and scaling of training solution. Again, this is no longer just simple prototyping. We are moving towards a product that can be launched, huh? can be launched. Uh, to the market. So minimally, we are looking into at least two enterprise adoption. We definitely welcome project that can impact greater extent, that can be scaled beyond the, the, your, your sector, that right? can be scaled to multiple sector and can bring in, say, example, 100 or 1,000 adoption. So those are the key thing of the Inland 2.0 for the InnoSpur. So Inland 2.0 build on the uh, uh, build on the uh, 2.0 build on the 2020 Inland. So we focus again on scaling, and uh, in and to do so, we know that the Inland 2.0 will attempt to incubate prototype for industry wide application. Take note, industry wide application, not just one or two user. Huh? So uh, preferably, of course, uh, if if you if you were to do some development, mainly for example, if it is meant for the hospital, it should be able to go beyond the hospital. Huh? So, and uh, secondly, accelerate, to accelerate promising prototype towards commercialization. There must be an element of commercialization. Therefore, in the application form, you would need to write product 
market technology and commercialization plan. For those who join me after the 20 minutes, uh, you will see that uh, we will walk through the application process. And thirdly, uh, we have an innovation sandbox uh, thanks to SSG. This innovation sandbox provides innovators a conducive space for experimentation and implementation by seeking and granting time limited re regulatory waiver. So you, you, there is a separate process. Uh, uh, you can apply a separate application form for the uh, innovation sandbox. So this uh, will be eligible for SSG cost, fee funding, and for skill future credit. Most important is we have four focus areas. Huh? The first focus area is the increasing the uptake of online and blended learning by individual. So the focus of this first focus area, one is the uh, online and blended by individual. So in the application form, you will have to indicate to us whether is it uh, one, two, or three, or four. The second focus area, we seek to amplify enterprise. The word is enterprise adoption of the EdTech, which is innovative learning technology. So this is at enterprise level. Third focus area, which is to develop effective remote assessment and proctoring for individual and enterprise. And lastly, uh, to develop effective placement solution. Uh, so this is uh, that tightens the industry training nexus. So this we are looking into placement solution. So take note again, uh, your, your uh, application must fit into at least one of the four focus area. I think uh, next, okay. Uh, a summary of the incubator accelerator, uh, we call it InnoSpur here. Uh, uh, you already seen uh, incubator is uh, 200,000 and, and uh, over accelerator up to, again, up to, up to 500,000. Uh, the project should not uh, take more than a year. Uh, and then, of course, the last one is the uh, innovation, uh, innovation sandbox. So this will actually help innovators surmount regulatory obstacles to, uh, to assess, uh, example, cost fee for funding or the skill future. Separate application each. Huh? Okay. Okay. So here is also a snapshot. We have InnoGem. I think uh, InnoGem that provides 5,000 for ideation. We have InnoGrowth uh, that uh, is a joint uh, collaboration with IMDA, whereby selected uh, output from InnoGem who meet certain standards would receive additional $10,000 funding to bring the technology readiness level of at least a one or a two. With the one or two technology readiness level or so-called TRL, they can apply to the Inno Plus. Inno Plus uh, provides up to 200,000 uh, per project on a open competition uh, aspect. And there are two calls per year, usually. And, uh, and uh, this is to develop a uh, prototyping uh, and piloting. So the uh, TRL technology readiness level, we are looking at at least a three, more than a three, uh, more than a three uh, uh, after the Inno Plus. And uh, after the Inno Plus, you can also apply to the accelerator or the InnoSpur, we call it over here. Uh, however, the InnoSpur can also accept applicants who are not from the InnoPlus. So don't worry, you're not from InnoPlus, you can also uh, come in into InnoSpur. So take note, Inno, InnoSpur is now uh, under the Inland 2.0. We want to bridge the gap to market and commercialization and for wider adoption. So uh, we will target uh, learn tech enterprises. And uh, there is a core contribution of 25% uh, for the InnoSpur. So there'll be three winners per year. And uh, today is the launch. Eligibility criteria. Uh, this is the moment everyone is waiting. You must be a Singapore registered company. You can be a foreign company, but you need to be registered in Singapore. As long as you are registered, <coughs> and you're operating with a local UEN. Also, this is um, this is the this is the key uh, key um, key uh, criteria, and then the four focus area we already went through: uh, uptake of uh, online blended by individual, enterprise adoption of ag tech, uh, remote assessment and proctoring, and lastly placement solution. Okay. 
Uh, project duration will be 12 months. 12 months is, uh, is okay. And uh, up to 500,000 of the project qualifying costs. So what are the qualifying costs? Uh, other condition uh, 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 criteria is 25% co-contribution. Uh, it also refers to basic manpower costs, equipment costs, software costs, material costs, consumables, and professional services. So there'll be a two stage of evaluation. Uh, we call it the short uh, shortlisting stage and the award stage or the winning stage. So the uh, the the uh, the award or winning stage comprises of uh, people or, or the, uh, the evaluator from the SSG, IAL, and a few of the uh, of or maybe I put it three of the uh, uh, three of the reviewer from the uh, industries. So what are the criteria for that we, we will do in the shortlisting stage? So the shortlisting stage will be done by IAL. We will look for completeness of proposal. That means please do the proposal correctly. Uh, of course, we are not looking into your English grammar. We are looking into completeness that all those things that we wanted, like example, reason for the product that you that we stipulated in the application form, duty, uh, uh, Talk through and then complete, and we also check for your compliance with uh with our other conditions like, uh do you comply with the four focus area and your learning outcome? So basically, we also we look for the quality of proposal again, not in report writing, but whether you have the content, uh in uh, that you have written over there, product, market, technology, commercialization plan, to achieve the TRL of at least a seven. And uh, and uh, and uh, you need to come in with uh, at least two enterprise adoption. So for applicants who are coming in, uh, get the letter of adopt, get the letter of a uh, of of, uh, of a support from them, and uh, attach them in your proposal. And uh, it'd be good if they come from two different sector. And once with all this document uh, available, the team internal team plus uh, some reviewer. We will look into several aspects. Example, the business aspect, which is the market and competition, the reason for your product, and uh, how, how extent of innovativeness, etc. And we look into your receiver, which is the, uh, the adopter. Who are your adopters? And uh, who are they? Are they from the same sector? How big are they? Uh, in uh, 3C, 3C, we look into technology, whereby we look into your uh, proposed application. And of course, another concern is intellectual property. <coughs> I would like to take this opportunity to share. Um, again, is uh, we are we we are all this money comes from the public, so that is actually uh, uh, you may want to make reference to a national IP protocol. Also, the word I use is national IP protocol. It is available in IPOS IPOS. Take a look into the uh, IP uh, protocol, and it will tell you that. Uh, 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 a grantee who wants to take a grant from the government, publicly funded grant, uh, there are certain 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 rights that the uh, sponsors would like to to continue. But we recognize that the basic that the uh, basic IP, which is the uh, background IP, belongs to you. Uh, yeah. So this one no issue because this these are all yours. So yeah. So you need to set, certainly settle this IP issue with among your your collaborators or your adopters. And uh, 3D, we will look into your project uh, project plan, your project uh, proposal, your plan, your resource, whether you have uh, a team or you have sufficient resources and competency to do the project. And lastly, we will look into your risk, challenges, and mitigation measures. So this, this, this criteria form the uh, stage one. So take note, okay, these are just highlight of some important consideration. Uh, don't forget when you write a report, the extent of innovativeness, uh, whether is it incremental innovation, whether is this a radical innovation, or is it modular innovation or architecture innovation. So you will know better than me. In the application form, we will already have the jargon uh, clearly defined. Huh? And I also refer you to places whereby you can actually uh, read up and, uh, and then internalize yourself. Secondly, we look into scalability within and beyond Singapore. 
And of course, uh, we want to look into, uh, I do agree, of course, all innovation has risks, uh, but it also has to be, uh, uh, risk has to be identified and probably mitigated. You cannot tell me that you have a risk and the risk is so open and uh, nobody knows how to, uh, how to mitigate the risk. So please come up with a uh, suitable risk mitigation strategy. And uh, we look into your track record and, and of course the skills and competency of your project team. <clears throat> Once you pass through the shortlisting stage, the real evaluation begins. A, B, C, D. A, we look into how, whether you could contribute to the grant objective. So basically means you must be, minimally must be at least one of the four focus area and whether you can contribute to inland goal of driving innovation. And uh, of course, the uh, potential to uh, increase adoption for individual enterprises. So these are very clearly defined that you have, you need to articulate in the application form. And what is success to you? Please, a success is it? Uh, uh, take the final thousand dollar and then you um, you you create a you create a final product and then final product is being rolled to two or two say uh, two uh, two two companies. So he give uh, or the the uh, final product is going to be rolled to more than uh, one thousand uh, learners. Yeah, please let me know. Huh? So you have to be very clearly articulated in the proposal. And in a category B, we look into the strength of your scientific excellence or your or the development excellence in a innovation potential. So here is very uh, technical based, uh, the middle point extent of innovativeness and technology readiness level. Please do not write to say that uh, uh, you will not be able to reach a TRL of seven. The definition of TRL will be given to you in the application form. Also, it will be given in the application form. Uh, and um, innovativeness, again, as I mentioned, there are four categories. Whether is it incremental, whether is it modular, architecture, uh, or, or, or radical. Huh? Of course, radical means new product and new market. Uh, so these are, uh, these, are, these, are, these are very important stuff. And a learning solution. Uh, take note again, the last point, uh, pedagogical underpinning. Yes, uh, we although this is uh looks like a ag tech looks like a technology uh, technology uh, uh, uh application, but we want to see the uh, incorporation of pedagogical underpinning, uh, that has been considered in the um in the whole in the whole proposal. You will have to write you will have to write about two pages of uh, your pedagogical underpinning. Uh, your 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 adoption of uh, learning theories, and then finally, of course, the uh, tie to the learning theories. Uh, you have a pedagog pedagogical underpinning. Example: If you are if you are learning, if you have uh, if you are doing collaborative in the area of collaborative learning, then what are the pedagogical underpinning that you have uh, highlighted, and and how are you going to incorporate that pedag pedagogical underpinning into your act tank? So we want to know uh, that you need to address, and then this will be separately given to uh, a reviewer uh, who is uh, familiar with the uh, with this subject matter for their evaluation. So A, B, and then finally we have a C and a D. <coughs> C is uh, important. First, don't forget again, we are all in Singapore. We want a vibrant TAE sector, right? So uh, we welcome foreigners, uh, foreign companies who set up presence in Singapore. Please come over, put in some money and then uh, inject into uh, Singapore and then set, uh, set up a company, take a local UEN and then participate. But you can participate with collaborators, uh, your, 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 co your collaborators. We leave it to you to appoint your co collaborators in the application form. You have to identify your collaborators, which is your adopter, minimally two. Try to get adopters that can proliferate to a great impact that can actually go beyond uh, scale, that scale beyond Singapore or more. We actually call this uh, ecosystem disruption. Also, diversity in the participating pilot and ecosystem disruption. We challenge you to come up with something that that create ecosystem disruption. And of course, in accepting the challenge, if, and if you face that, there are certain constraints, certain constraints, certain rules that you think needs to be broken. Let us know. We are prepared to put it up, assess it, 
to SSG for their consideration, that will be under the innovation sandbox. So there is a separate form. So again, please challenge us by telling us that you have an innovative idea that is so diversified and it can disrupt the ecosystem. We are prepared to hear. And if you have concern on how to get it done, don't worry, submit to us under the uh, innovation sandbox application side. In the innovation sandbox uh, application, we have prepared a guide. Uh, you just have to uh, follow the guide, look through the document, and, uh, and then prepare, uh, prepare the necessary uh, 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 content and send back to us. We will look through, we will screen through, and if we feel that uh, you have met uh, the objective, we will certainly be happy to compile and then give it to our sponsors, SSG, for their consideration. And lastly, D, execution strength and technical competency. I think without said, again, uh, money is there, but uh, we, you need a team. Uh, if you are uh, head count, but you don't have the expertise and experience, uh, uh, you, were, you, you, you are unlikely to, uh, to be able to resolve obstacles easily. Okay, so, uh, a, a quick walkthrough of the evaluation process. It will start with a launch today. Then uh, there'll be a uh, three session, 15, 26, and 12. Please register for the, for the session. So for this session, what you can do uh, is uh, from now to the 15, you have about two weeks. Get the application form, download from the uh, IL website, perhaps by tonight or tomorrow. And then uh, look through the application form and start to work on the application form. As you work on the application form, you think you are not clear, or uh, you want some further advice, you can book this session on the 15, 26, and on the 12th. We will walk through with you on your application form on your write up. If you are ready again, you if you are ready, you got two weeks to write, and we will advise you whether uh, whether uh, whether was there a misrepresentation? Was there uh, some support, further support from uh, from uh, from us? So in the afternoon, maybe uh, there are some 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 framework I see necessary for you to use in application form. Proposal submission very important date uh, 19 September uh, 4 p.m. Uh, please submit the application form to uh, William P Y H at um, I L E D U. And CC to, I think you saw the lady, uh, Miss Scott uh, Chi Wing. Uh, the process requires us to have two, two persons to receive it uh, so that that is a, is a form of audit. Huh? So it's a form of audit. So you please uh, send to me, CC to her. And uh, by this due date, we will follow the due date and time shortly. And please don't submit multiple application form. Uh, we will only uh, receive uh, one application form because I will not know which is the latest that I should adopt. If you have uh, sent me a late multiple application form, I can only take the latest before the cut off time. And after I will receive it, I mentioned we have the uh, we have the uh, formality check, evaluation check, and then finally the shortlisted uh, for, uh, applicant will send it to stage two to be evaluated. We are expecting to provide an award. Uh, in November 2022, and the next call will be in late no, uh, uh, 2022 or so. Okay, this, this is just a snapshot of our internal gate processes. So you see, we have a, we have a, we have a series of screening, and, uh, and uh, after this screening, uh, we would then push it to, into stage two. So this is going to be the last few, last two slides, I think. Yeah. So please, uh, you in the application form, uh, there is no info kit. We already put it into the website, and then uh, and uh, read through the application form. There are series of annexes to guide you in preparing the submission. Once you have all those submissions done closely, uh, there is a declaration. Uh, you have to sign and stamp the declaration. And uh, once that is all done, uh, you will then send to uh, send to William Pay, and then a CC to Miss Cobb, and uh, and by the due date and due time. So on the right hand side, I'll give you a snapshot of the application form that I will be walking through to those who wants to uh, know more about the application process. Okay, uh, last slide now, uh, 19 September, uh, uh, sixteen hundred. 
4 p.m. sent to the two person in this call for proposal. I think with this, uh, with this, I have, uh, yeah, with this, I actually end this uh, presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you, William. And uh, we are open for Q and A now. But first, William, can you help me answer some of the online questions? So we have Eddie who asked, can the same project be funded by multiple parties? Example, a star. Same project be funded. Uh, okay. To 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 answer you, uh, uh, we cannot double dip. If it's the same project, we cannot double dip. Uh, this is this is the rule of the publicly funded. Uh, 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 innovation in initiative guideline provided by the ministry. Huh? So naturally, right? If you've got same project with same title, you go to ESG for funding, you come to me for funding, you go to IMDA for funding, but whereas the project scope are the same. So basically is that if the same title, same project, you cannot be asking for additional funding. Yep. So Eddie, hope this answers your question. And to answer Tabby's question, is this yearly? Yes, it is. And anyone from uh, online, anyone has any further questions? If you have questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask them, or you can leave them in the chat. Or if you are processing the information, we can you can ask the inf uh, questions later via email to William and myself directly later. Yeah. If there are no further questions, then would you like to? Yeah, if, if no further questions, I think uh, for those who are involved in the clinic, I will I will uh, I will move uh, to the main hall uh, to do to walk through with you on the application process and to highlight the certain special conditions. Okay, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, hi, I, I've got a question. Uh, I'm doing online right now. I'm not at the hmm. place there. How do I go about going the clinic? I see. I see. Uh, you you want to raise our question here? Uh, probably I think there is some uh, other clinic sessions, right? That uh, yes, yeah. So so what I do is I gather my questions, right? But I don't know whether is it too late or not. I guess there's one on the fifteenth of August. Yeah, mm, two weeks time. Yeah, but how do I know the time and the venue? There is a link in our website for you to register uh, for any of the event, 15, 26, and uh, 12. Oh, can I email you since I've got your email now? You can email me. We can provide you with a link. No issue. Yes. Yeah, correct. All right. Because uh, what, what, we are in, uh, what, we are, what, what I'm trying to propose would be something like, uh, uh, like you have STEM and STEAM into the young, but the PMEDs, you don't have anything there. So I think that's what we are trying to do. And then I, 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 I'm I, also a PMAT and I understand the problems uh, with ATE along this way with Learn Tech. Uh, yeah, Certainly. so I have, I have, I've I've been a grantee for, for some of the government processes. By Very then. good. I guess you have also uh, outsourced it to people like Maximus and Ingius to, 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 to find employment. I think the learning organization is where the, the ecosystem needs to be disrupted. Agree, agree, fantastic win. Yeah, uh, so I, I would like first to personally meet up with you on say maybe on the 15th. Now, if you can send me the link, I'll write email to you and then uh, can understand the process. Yes, yeah, and yes. I guess since there's a round two, meaning what, what do you mean? There's a call for proposal round two, means what? Uh, call for proposal round two in late November. This is call for proposal one, so the second call for proposal is in November. Okay, another one question. Sorry, uh, William. Yes. Uh, the other question is, how would I know whether I'm at which RTL level? Ah, that uh, in the can I, can I go from zero to seven? I mean, we 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 have a we have a, I have an idea and we have a team. Uh, basically, I'm a I'm the country head of a training okay. academy. Okay. I've been okay. put tasked to figure out how to help learners apply because you're going Max Bloom's uh, Bloom's taxonomy. You know, all the understanding is wasted if you don't even apply in the company yes. to the employee. And that has such itself, it becomes wasted even if the government pour a lot of funds into it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. so anyway, I'll take it offline with you. Um, okay. uh, round two means maybe a, a, a step up from this round itself, like, I guess. Sure, sure. Uh, and Andrew, uh, okay, yes. so for anyone who is interested to stay on for the clinic session, we'll leave the session open. But let us just conclude uh, the InnoVite session. For now, right? Yeah. So for those who are interested, then uh, later you all, we, uh, we will keep the session open now. All right? So All for right. now, I would like to conclude uh, today's InnoVite session and we will want to thank our uh, speakers, Linda and William, for joining and also for uh, 
Learning Library for having us, of course, Apida for helping us. And also, thank you to SSG for coming down as well to support this event. And so we actually have uh, events, upcoming events, in another InnoVite session in August and Innov uh, and also Innov Plus session. But I will send them, in the interest of time, I'll just send them in an email along with today's uh, speaker's email in the post-event uh, email that you received later. Yeah. So thank you very much for making time and back to you, Abida. Okay, thank you, Wing. Um, I can foresee that there will be intense proposal writing after this. Uh, okay, before we actually end the whole session, the Learning Library would like to share some uh, resources. Uh, probably it could help you in your writing. I don't know, but please do give the recommendations a try. Okay, let me share my screen. <coughs> Okay, this one here. Okay, these are the uh, ebooks that we have uh, collated from the National Library website. Okay, uh, these slides will be sent to you after the event, so no worries, you can't catch the quotes or the web links. Okay. Uh, we also have two e learning courses. They are available from the Udemy business. It's on the related topic, MVP and product launch, product launch, product launch and marketing plan. All right. Um, the quotes and links uh, in the slides will be sent to you afterwards. Okay. Uh, this is my second last slide. Uh, this is for next week's talk. Is the title is using personality diversity awareness to embrace diversity and inclusion. If you're interested, please sign up and I hope to see you next week for this talk. Okay, last but not least, this is our feedback uh, uh, channel, the quotes and the link. This is where you can submit your comments and how we can improve our programs. I'll flash this a few seconds um, more for you to catch the slides. Uh, the, the, the link, sorry, and the code. So in the meantime, I would like to thank IEL, Wing, and the speakers for today's talk and, um, and the participants as well for making us part of your lunchtime. Thank you. Thank you.